Brothers, it really is a joy to have the uh, uh, opportunity of some conversation uh, together. And uh, I've been given the privilege of asking you all the questions, so you have to give all the answers. Um, and uh, looking forward to um, uh, this opportunity. I want to try and keep this as, as practical as possible. That theme has run really uh, throughout um, uh, our conference already and, and will continue this morning. And, and in, in my mind, there are really three broad spheres for the next 45 minutes uh, or so for us to talk a little bit about prayer in um, our own lives. Uh, what is that like for you? A little bit about prayer in regards to the church and in regards to uh, ministry, public worship, corporate prayer gatherings, small groups, so forth and so on. Perhaps a little bit about prayer in the family in relation to children, and then perhaps at the end, any resources that would be uh, helpful for folks uh, uh, to, um, uh, uh, to, 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 to read by way of, of follow-up. Um, so just to frame the, um, uh, the question about personal prayer first, one of the things I've done over the years and found quite useful is to have some envelopes that are just discussion starters for pastoral conversations. If I'm meeting with someone for no particular reason, and I'll say, you know, we have an hour together and uh, we can talk about anything you want, or if there's nothing particularly on your mind, I've got some suggestions here, and, and there's a, an issue or a question on each envelope, and one of them is, how would you describe your prayer life? And in each envelope, there are some cards, and what I've found again and again is that if I give people, you know, six, seven options of something to talk about, the number one choice is always, I'd like to talk about my prayer life. And then people take out these cards and they put them on the table, and there's one word on each card, and it would be like, you know, fruitful, faith-filled, hard work, and people sort out the words. And the two words that overwhelmingly I've found people sort out are irregular, and aimless. And so I've had many conversations with folks who love the Lord but feel that their prayer lives are irregular and aimless. What have you found in pastoral conversation with people um, that, that helps folks to grow in their prayer life, which is really the theme at the very heart of our, our time together over these two days? Um, Juan, why don't you start off? <clears throat> Sure. We're not talking about our prayer life, but how, how yes. we have helped others. Yeah. Um, there are three words that I've learned to use repeatedly, and that's time, place, and plan. Hmm. And one of the ways that I, th I find most helpful, and this is for me, maybe others, you know, maybe it's not as helpful to others, but I just try to hammer home, you know, you have to have a time, a plan, and a place. Because if we don't have a plan, even a prayer plan, it, it does become aimless. Right. We don't right. know what to say. We don't know how to pray. It doesn't have to be an elaborate plan. It can be a simple plan, but also a time. There's a little book. I don't remember who, who wrote it. It's, um, it's not a Christian book. It's called Daily Rituals. Hmm. And it's a book about daily rituals of artists, writers, composers, painters. And, and one of the, the themes that comes out of there is every creative person, they still have a plan. They have a structure. They have a daily ritual. And, and it's like the, the, the writer who sits at that desk with that cup of coffee at that time, your brain says, okay, this is writing time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just establishing a time gives you regularity. It gives you a goal. Again, you, you know, you may not have, be able to do that all the time. But for me, in the way that God made me, when I have a time that this is what I do at this time, a place, I sit down at a, you know, at a place in my house uh, with my cup of coffee, uh, and then I have a plan, that helps me to be productive. And just a couple of sentences on the plan. What would a plan look like? Sure. Uh, this is something I learned as a young, young Christian, and it was given to me by a friend of mine. Monday, I pray for missionaries. Tuesday, I pray for tasks that I have before me. Um, Wednesday, I pray for workers in the kingdom. So that's when I pray for our elders and our deacons and our staff. Thursday, I pray for the ministries in the church. Friday, I pray for family and friends. Saturday, I pray for sinners. Sunday, I pray for services. And, and that just kind of gives me a structure. That's not all I pray for. And then on my Evernote, I have daily prayer lists that are related to that. And, um, and then I pray a page a day through our church directory right. for, for the members, something I learned from, from Mark Dever. 
Uh, and so just knowing that, I don't go into prayer overwhelmed. I know where, we're, I know where I'm going. And then as, as, the, as the Spirit leads me to pray for other things as well, yes. Marvelous. Kevin, you want to jump in? All of us on the stage included would say our prayer life at times is irregular and aimless. I would certainly say that about myself. So the people in our churches who feel that are, are in good company or we're in good company, everything Juan said is, is really helpful and important. I'll just add to it to say a plan is so important because think about it. If, if anything, so if you're trying to pray for 10 minutes, 15 minutes, half hour, even five minutes, how many of us about anything would just hit the alarm, get a cup of coffee, roll out of bed, go, talk meaningfully about something for 15 minutes, yeah. go. No, you, you wouldn't do it. You would have some sort of plan and to have a prayer card, I have something similar with certain days of the week, pray through things. And then I would allow yourself to have, th this was a book uh, I read years ago, probably lesser known by David Hansen. I don't even know where he is in ministry now, but it was called Long Wandering Prayer. And he allows for, and I think wisely, that sometimes prayer is aimless. And you can think of it as the, the daily, I'm organized, I'm getting a prayer card, a prayer list, that's important. And I think it's also important and okay to have times that are sort of aimless. Here's my, here's my scriptural warrant for that. It's a different message, but Psalm 55 begins David by saying, my prayer to you, O God. So it's a prayer. And if you read through Psalm 55, it is a meandering prayer. At times, he's speaking as we would think of as prayer to you, O God, this way. Other times he's speaking to himself, he's telling him things. Then he goes and he speaks in third person, and then he's thinking about this man who is his enemy, and he's sort of directing him. It is really offering up the burdens and conversation of his heart in a Godward direction. If that's all you do, then you're probably missing something. But to allow for those times where prayer seems aimless, seems wandering, I think is, is okay, and there's some scriptural warrant that prayer is lifting our conversation and our hearts Godward. And very practically, I've, uh, I don't know if you, you mentioned this in your list of things to do, but walking. Walking has been a huge benefit for me, very practically, almost every morning when I'm praying. If it's uh, dark out, maybe walk on the treadmill in our house, or whenever I can, I go outside because I don't live up here anymore, and so uh, <laughs> it's, it's warm sometimes during the year, and I can get out because I get sleepy. I sit down, I try to pray, I get sleepy. And if I go on a walk and I go 15 minutes out, 15 minutes back, even if my mind is scattered here and there, I have a half hour and it's much harder to fall asleep when you're walking. <laughs> and there's all sorts of scientific studies about, you know, they've done the brain scans and what starts firing and parts of your brain that light up when you're, when you're doing physical movement. So that very simple realization that it still counts as prayer even if I'm moving, has been really helpful. That's really good. HB, what else would you like to add either for helping others or what has helped you? Yeah, I would amen everything that has already been said. I would add one note practically and then say something um, spiritual. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean that. that's the only word I could think of, but... Practically, what I have found helpful, time, place, plan, totally agree with. I would add to that um, just helps. Um, reading scripture along with prayer. Yes. Stirs us up for prayer. My hymnal, I keep a hymnal. Huh. It's probably a key tool of mine for prayer. And then I am always reading 
through some devotional. Um, because there are times just to get in a spirit, a mind for prayer, I, I need my thoughts stirred up for the bigness of God. Um, I would say during the early part of COVID, it just weighed on me and there were matters. I just, I was going, I had a broken heart. And just, I knew I needed to pray. Um, well, two things helped me through there. I was writing my prayers out with something practical. And then co connected to that though, just the mornings, I would just read a couple of those prayers out of Valley of Vision. And it was just helping me to lift my thoughts beyond where I, where I was. So I think helps, and, and I'm sure there are others that could be mentioned beyond those. Um, spiritually, what I want to say is, in the conversations I have, I have a lot of conversations about the things we are discussing. But many times, I think believers struggle more than my conversations with the motivation to pray. They, when we are going through something, our instinct is to do something. And we don't think prayer is doing something. And we are tempted to neglect prayer. And what I have, what I have learned out of my study in the scriptures is that the Bible says more about the motivation for prayer than it does the techniques of prayer. Hmm. It's not a lot of discussion about methodologies, techniques, patterns. It is a lot said about the motivation to pray. And so I, I try to remind my own heart, I try to share with others, you know, and they're just, I think, three biblical primary motivations for prayer. Number one, it is an act of obedience. There are commands after command after command to pray. And to the degree that I desire to be obedient to God, submissive to his word, it is a motivation to pray. And beyond anything else, obedience is its own reward. Secondly, the Bible motivates us to pray by telling us over and over again, hold on to your seat, it works. <laughs> it is amazing that with commands to pray, there are so many commands to pray that are directly attached to a promise. And a lot of times you can read books or hear sermons on prayers or even come to an event in prayer and you just feel so beaten down about how weak your prayer life is. Yeah. And that really isn't the tone of Scripture. The tone of Scripture is motivating us to pray, wooing us to pray, compelling us to pray with wonderful promises of what God will do if you call on Him. Yeah. The third thing I would say, and I mentioned it last night, is that prayer advertises our dependence upon God. Mm. Prayer is a declaration of dependence. And I think that's the... I don't mean to minimize what we are doing. But I think that's the key to prayer. The key, in one sentence, the key to effective prayer is a heart of dependence. My willingness, my, my diligence, my devotion to prayer exposes who or what I truly depend on. And there are times when we will not feel like praying. There are times when prayer is hard, it is a struggle. We press through during those times as a declaration that I am trusting God in the midst of this, not something or someone else. Um, so along with the practical things, I just think it is important to keep before ourselves and keep before others biblical motivations for believing prayer. HB, thank you. This is rich stuff and very, very practical and, and very helpful. Uh, HB, like, like you, my pastor said to me years ago, always pray with an open Bible. That one sentence has been so helpful because it fuels confession of sin. You spot things that you say, 
that's something I need to put right, that's something that needs to be addressed. It fuels intercession, that's something I can pray for someone else. Uh, it fuels thanksgiving, so it, it just brings a freshness to prayer. It, it gives you something to pray out of that in its very nature is going to be different um, uh, each day. Let, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, prayer in regards to uh, the ministry of the, the local church. And uh, I, I got three aspects in mind. Maybe um, each of you could just pick one and comment on. Um, one is um, public prayer and worship. It strikes me that that is in decline in many churches. It strikes me that it's very important in the Scriptures that it's part of public worship. Maybe someone could comment um, uh, on that. Uh, what about small groups? Uh, how, how do you encourage meaningful prayer uh, in the context of small groups? And what about prayer gatherings, gatherings simply for prayer? So, you know, pick one or more than one, and uh, perhaps we can comment on these aspects of prayer in the life of the church. I'll just start with the first one in corporate worship. I, I totally agree. I think you would go to many churches. I'll trust not the churches represented here, but you'd go to many churches, and prayer would be barely more than a, an opportunity for the band members to transition That's off right. the stage. That's right. Yep. yep. And for the pastor to come up on the stage. You, you say hello, you maybe have the glad handing of the peace, and you have a, an opening worship set, a little transitional prayer. The Lord is praised in those worships. People get saved in those services. It is impoverished, and it is not building upon our forefathers in the faith who have thought a lot about it. Whether you go all the way, I mean, we have a, a fairly traditional, I would like to say historic, robust, Presbyterian, Reformed liturgy for our, our worship service. <laughs> But we have a, a prayer of invocation, which is, so you have a call to worship, that's God calling us to worship, and a prayer of invocation to invoke, ask God then, we're speaking to Him. People want dialogue in worship, and what they sometimes mean is we want to be talking back and forth, can we ask questions? The dialogue is, is vertical, and the, the traditional Protestant worship service had that built in. God's calling us, we're responding. So we have a prayer of adoration. We have a prayer of invocation. We have uh, almost every Sunday, we have a prayer of confession of sin and then assurance of pardon. And we have a long pastoral prayer. I tell our guys not to make it too long. So it's, you know, five, six minutes, sometimes seven. And a prayer of uh, illumination before the message, a prayer after it. So there are, almost every Sunday, there are five or six different prayers, and from time to time we will take a moment to try to teach the congregation that those are actually different kinds of prayers, trying to serve different elements in the worship service, and it can feel like, oh man, we just oh, close our eyes, but there's a real rich rhythm to it, and uh, in particular, just since you asked, if, if your church doesn't have, especially if you're in charge of making this happen, don't go you know, just back and start complaining, but if you don't have that long, whatever you call it, an intercessory prayer, pastoral prayer, where you're praying for the, the needs of the congregation, that is such a rich way to not only pray for those things, but to model for your congregation. I remember one time years ago, a member of the congregation said, you know, when I first came to this church and you had all these prayers and you had that long prayer, and I have to tell you, I would get sleepy and it was kind of boring. You'd pray for five, six minutes. I didn't know why you had it. And I can see now five years later, part of what you were doing was trying to teach us how to pray, trying to yes. model the things yes. to pray for. Yes. So very few of our evangelical, even good Bible-believing evangelical churches uh, are too steeped in prayer, and, and we've lost something. Yeah. H.P.? Yeah, I will quickly make two points, if I may. Um, I think critical is the prayer and public worship. I was recently at a sound conservative church event and it was just afterward they they reminded me maybe up to five times before I spoke make sure you pray at the end of this message and make sure you pray long enough to give the orchestra time to make it back to the stage 
Um, you ooh and ah, the only bad thing about that is that it's not rare. It's just not rare. Um, Kevin is right. A lot of places, two things I see neglected in my own travels, I, I sit in services and I, I don't see the public reading of scripture. First Timothy 4.13. And in our worship services each week, we are reading through a chapter of the Bible consecutively through books and it freaks people out. <laughs> and I just, my only response is, if you can't read the Bible in church, where can you read it? <laughs> and the other thing is just, just prayer. I have been saying to our congregation, it, it should not take a guest to come to a secondary meeting, a prayer meeting, a small group, or something else to know that this is a house of prayer. Yeah, that's good. It ought to be evident in our Sunday morning assemblies of corporate worship. I would say central to that is the pastoral prayer. And if I may say this, it's how I cheat. Because there's a lot of things that go on in our nation, in our culture, in our city that my members get really upset about that I don't have a statement on. Yeah. What, what mitigates that though is I pray about everything. Hmm. And I am going to cover those matters in prayer. And I think praying about it is better than talking about it. Hmm. And I am modeling, I am trying to model for the church in that pastoral prayer how to think and how to prayerfully respond to those things. I think so. I think, I think a great revival uh, would begin if we just took, I believe in prayer meeting. That was the other thing I would say. I'll just skip that part. But I would just say if churches just took prayer more seriously, in the corporate worship services, that could really be a spark of revival. And I think that starts with those of us who are pastors mm. taking the pastoral prayer more seriously. Um, Pat Quinn, mm -hmm. our elders a few months ago read Praying in Public, and it just sparked um, a lot of conversations about us being more intentional about our public and pastoral prayers. I think um, if that is central, um, it, it'll take you a long way and take a step forward. Really good. Yeah, I, I would echo the importance of corporate prayer in the worship gathering. And if you don't know where to begin, I would begin with the pastoral prayer. Uh, just uh, think through the different categories that you can be praying and modeling for the congregation. But uh, we also have a Sunday evening prayer gathering on the second and fourth Sunday nights. And that's just a time where we're praying for things in the church. It's kind of a family time. We will, we will interview uh, young couples that are getting married. We'll interview young parents who just had a baby. Uh, we'll pray for very specific things in the life of the church. We'll pray the word. So from the sermon, we'll take some application prayers and, and pray those for us, for the congregation. And then for, uh, for missionaries, gospel partners, those kinds of things. And that's just a regular time. It, it becomes a very sweet time for us in, in that uh, it's like the family coming together. We'll, we'll do different things. Sometimes, uh, like this last time, I gave everyone just a few minutes to break up into pairs, uh, to pray for one another, to share requests to one another and then pray. Uh, but often uh, we have ordered the prayer requests uh, thinking through them, and then I'm assigning people, you know, would you pray for this? Would you pray for this? And then we just spend time praying. That's good. Um, First Timothy chapter 2, I think very obviously would be a primary passage of Scripture that really um, mandates um, uh, um, a prayer as part of, uh, of public um, uh, worship. And um, uh, really, really helpful to speak about it. It strikes me that 
we need to work at the preparation of this. It's very striking to me that, you know, in order to speak from God to people, uh, we put in 20 hours preparation to a sermon, perhaps. Um, well, what preparation goes in to the opposite, which is speaking on behalf of people to God? Uh, there needs to be some preparation for that. I, I have to say one of the things that I am most thankful uh, for um, here in the orchard uh, is, is the place of intercessory prayer in public worship. It's part of the training we do. Um, uh, all of our pastors um, work really well in terms of preparation um, uh, to pray uh, in that regard. Uh, ju just, a, just a resource that might be helpful to people. I think probably the classic work on this um, is a book by uh, Samuel Miller, uh, that uh, is entitled, uh, here's another brilliant title, we were joking about titles last night, uh, Thoughts on Public Prayer. That was before they had marketing people to um, uh, come up with a, a snappy title. But, but the good news is, rather than reading a book from many years ago, Ligon Duncan has condensed Samuel Miller's uh, material uh, into an article that you can find on the Nine Marks website. It is called, so you just Google this, 32 Principles for Public Prayer. And there are 18 do's and 14 don'ts, and they're really perceptive and helpful. And Lake has updated this. And so just as a resource, because um, in cultivating this in the life of the church, you want to be trying to <clears throat> help and encourage those who will be leading in prayer and some do's and don'ts um, will be stimulating. So again, that is 32 principles for public prayer. Ligon Duncan has condensed down that material from Samuel Miller, and you'll find it on the Nine Marks um, uh, website. Um, uh, uh, anything more on, on, on prayer meetings, gatherings for prayer? Uh, Juan, you got us going a little bit on that. Your brothers want to add anything to that? How, how do you do that, and how does it how does it work? What's the dynamic of these meetings? <clears throat> Again, preparation is key to lead a good prayer meeting. And we've all been to prayer meetings that are called the prayer meeting, and it's not a prayer meeting. It's the the pastor is supposed to give a 20 minute message, and then you take prayer requests, and everyone give, and that takes 20 minutes, and then someone prays for five minutes, and. That's not bad to do that, and the Lord hears those. But to plan to pray, again, if you just start with your people and say, let's go pray for an hour, that's really daunting for, for most of us. But it's amazing how some planning can make an hour or start as a half hour go really quickly. So when I came to the church I serve now five years ago, they have a weekly staff prayer meeting, and it, w it was more like the pastor gives a 25-minute meditation devotional, and then you break up into tables. So I just changed it and said, we're going to model leading a time of 30 or 35 minutes in prayer. And now we have a separate evening service, so we will take some of our evening services throughout the year to just pray for an hour. And what I mean by preparation is have an hour planned out to lead your people that includes, now we're going to sing this hymn, and, it, and it's a hymn that's directing us in prayer, and then I have two people lined up, I have two of the other elders, and they're going to come, and I've asked them to pray two minutes each for a specific topic, and then we're going to go into large group where people just shout out a sentence prayer, tell your people, I'm always saying this, pray short prayers in the prayer meeting. Uh, most of us are boring when we try to pray longer, so that's one. Two, when someone goes and does a four-minute soliloquy, it sends the message to everyone else, I can't really pray unless I can do this at a, for a long clip. So I tell people, I almost mandate, you have two sentences. Say something in two sentences. If, and then it, it just allows lots of other people, kids start saying something because they can give Thank you, God, for loving us and sending your son to die on the cross. So tell people to pray short when you do those, those large group prayers. And then we'll have a time in small group prayer, and you give them, you're just constantly giving them prompts. So, and you're leading people from up front, and I saw this modeled very well from Ben Patterson, who was my chaplain when I went to college, and he's, I also commend his books. You can just look him up wherever you buy books. Ben Patterson, he has a lot of really good books on prayer, and I saw him lead this well, very directive. 
So sort of having a sense for the room, it's getting quiet, and then he would, okay, now in your small groups, let's pray for our pastors, and that goes for two minutes, and, then, and now let's pray for the next three minutes and pray for our missionaries. And it's amazing when you just get someone up front leading, actually, in that time of prayer, and people know, I have three minutes, I better not do a soliloquy, I better say a few sentences, this guy's going to interrupt and direct us. So planning and real leadership and to jump in right away to pray and not to just say it's a prayer meeting and then we'll get to that the last five minutes. Anything to add, HB? <clears throat> yes. Um, I would say pre-pandemic, our schedule was so busy at the church that we were at a period where we kept moving the times of prayer, which is okay. Um, once we entered the pandemic and it cleaned out some of the things that were on our church schedule, we set, and it has remained now for three years, a Saturday morning time from eight to nine. And when I mentioned publicly the reminder of that prayer meeting, I am prone to say that I do not know, I'm talking to my congregation, I do not know anything more important that we do as a church than this hour of prayer. Um, me being here causes me to miss that hour. I'd, I'd almost rather miss Sunday than that hour of prayer. Um, I would, I think it's, critical to have a concentrated regular time of prayer. And I think, as the brothers mentioned, it needs to be planned well. And for me, th that means topics and texts. Hmm. So there are topics, for lack of a better term, that we, we're going to pray for this missionary. We're going to pray for this ministry opportunity that's before us. But a lot of the time I spend leading us to pray through text, where I'm just going to read a verse or two, and it may be a command to do something. And I'd say, here is the command. Now let's pray the Lord to help us to be obedient to this. And just kind of prompting, because I'm also trying to show our church to, to pray the scriptures, to pray the Bible. Um, I also, you know, bring into that prayer meeting, I lift it up, and I tell them, I brought my book of magic. It's a hymnal. <laughs> I tell them, this is a book of magic. <laughs> and I am selecting Prayerful hymns. There is a, there are rich hymns that are prayers set to music. And we are, I'm teaching, I'm trying to teach our church in that hour as well to pray to God through song as well. And I think that hour, another particular time is. Um, which is, I guess, has been so meaningful to me, is that most weeks the end of that prayer is going, prayer meeting is going to be me saying something about the text and the sermon for tomorrow. And we close, our closing section of prayer is, our, is, a, is a weekly prayer for the regular ministry of the word. And I just feel emboldened to preach as the saints I trust they are praying for the preaching but to be in that corporate time where you hear the saints covering the ministry of the word in prayer praying not just for the delivery of the message but praying for our hearts to be receptive to it um, I, I just think that's been Can I just add lesson. real quick yeah. to that and it's something HB has been underscoring one of our strengths and weaknesses as evangelical, often low church sort of Christians, our strength is 
we, we want prayer to really come from the heart. We don't want it to be rote. We want it to be meaningful. And so we, we lean to think extemporaneous prayer is really the prayer that counts. And there's something good about that impulse. But when, when Jesus and his disciples gathered to pray, almost certainly they were not doing popcorn prayer. <laughs> almost certainly they were, they were doing established synagogue sort of rituals, praying, rituals in a bad way. They're praying through psalms. They're doing the 18 benedictions. So don't lose that extemporaneous heartfelt, but you can pray heartfelt by singing a hymn or using helps from the, the Valley of Vision prayer book or reading scripture and making that your prayer. So sometimes we think that doesn't really count as prayer. And, and what HBC it said is so good, when you come and pray, and I know this is somewhat culturally bound, but when we've had prayer meetings, say, seven o'clock in the morning, we just say, we're going to start at seven exactly, we're going to end at 7.30 exactly, we're, you're not allowed to bring muffins, you're not allowed to bring <laughs> coffee, you can't do any of that. We're not doing that. You're, we're, someone's leading getting us going. We're praying at 7. You can count on it. We'll end at 7.30. Now, I know there's other cultures who say, well, that's not… But in, in most of our cultures in America, you do something like that. And it just gives people the freedom to know we're actually going to pray. I know when it's going to start. I know when it's going to end. And whatever you can do, whether you have an official prayer service or not, just start to work in some times of prayer. You probably heard the quip before. It's an exaggeration, but the quip that said, the people come on Sunday morning if they love the music. They come on Sunday evening if they love the preacher. They come to the prayer meeting if they love Jesus. <laughs> let, me, let me tell you, though, we pray from 8 to 9, and you're absolutely right. I watch. Yeah. At 9.01, my church gets out of the spirit. <laughs> they, when, if, if it don't end at nine, you could just see them looking at the clock at the back of the wall. So I gave I, you an hour, Pastor. Yeah, they gave That's you an it. hour on a Saturday morning. So I, I do think, you, you also right, the spirit, um, I, I am not charismatic, but I have a very high view of the Holy Spirit. And my view of the Holy Spirit is so high that I believe that his work is not limited to the extemporaneous. He can work with a plan, he can work in advance, and he can work with a schedule. Trust him to do that. <laughs> His brother's becoming Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin, I, I was just going to say that uh, at the Orchard, we, we are indebted to the Presbyterians uh, on this one. And continuing on the theme of, of plan, it must be... 30 years ago now that Karen and I uh, went to a communion season in Stornoway in the north of Scotland. Marvelous, marvelous occasion. And when communion is served on a Sunday, it's just twice a year. And as you would know very well, uh, the prayer meeting on the Saturday night by way of preparation is a really important event. You actually get a token uh, uh, on they still leaving. do that. Yes. Thrown away well, when we were there 30 years ago, this is what happened. You, you were given a token uh, that gave you admission to one of the seats that would be served on, on, uh, for communion the following morning. So we were there, 800 people in Stornoway on a Saturday night uh, prayer meeting, one of the most remarkable prayer meetings I've been in. But um, we'd arrived as guests. We're staying in this bed and breakfast, and um, the, the person who was leading uh, gets up and, and just starts. Everyone sits, of course, to sing and stands to pray. And uh, he said, I call upon the Reverend Colin Smith from London to lead us. And everyone stands. And I said to the, land, uh, the, the bed and breakfast lady we were staying with, what do I do? I go to the front? Or what, what do I do? No, no, no. You just pray from where you are. So um, I prayed. And then everyone sat down. And then we sang a psalm. And then I call upon, you know, and then someone else who was a guest was called upon, and then other elders, and so it went on. By the time we got to the end, I thought they'll think the guy from London had the shortest, weakest, <laughs> thinnest of prayers that they've ever heard in Stornoway. But that gave me the idea that to call upon particular people to lead in prayer and for them to have some notice of it is immensely helpful. And at a number of our campuses in the Orchard, that's what we're doing now, um, that we'll invite people to come and lead in prayer for a particular theme or area, 
and then one after maybe 12 people will come prepared to lead. And um, then it's regularly communicated. If others would like to do that, please let us know. And, and, and so that group expands and so forth. But um, we found that that immense, is immensely helpful in sustaining corporate prayer. It gets rid of all of the long silences and waiting for the next person. And I loved what you said about that, it just the leadership and some direction and some energy being brought to this so that the thing doesn't lull and lag. Um, uh, planning and preparation has been an interesting theme here. Let's, let's uh, we, um, uh, we got limited time uh, here. We've maybe got another uh, six minutes. And, May I and, yeah, throw please. one thing in? But I would also say, particularly for, for those leading prayer meetings, and I think it's been done well here over the course of this weekend. Do not be afraid of moments of silence. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. 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 There is the temptation to program everything yeah, that's so that there are all these smooth transitions and that there is no break. But I do think there is a place and there is power in those moments of silence for the saints to prayerfully meditate that's good. on what uh, that's good. they are hearing that's good. and receiving. Um, prayer in the family. Some brief comments on that. Any uh, wisdom insights from your own experience or from what you've seen others do that has been effective? And then we'll come back uh, just very briefly to uh, resources to recommend. But just first briefly on the family, any who wants to jump in on that? Um, what have you found useful? Uh, uh, Kevin, have you got a few children? Um, I have a, I have a few. <laughs> Uh, yes, I have nine children, so does my wife, it's good. <laughs> I sometimes will say, uh, I'll introduce myself, say we have, we're proud parents of five wonderful children. We have four others also, but <laughs> <laughs> my kids don't like when I do that. Yeah, I, f for, I, I get asked this question or something like it, I get asked a lot of what do you do for family worship? What do you do? And I'm, I'm the person you do and don't want to ask that question. My, my uh, successor at University Reformed Church, Jason Halopoulos, is amazing. He's written books on family worship, and he's really disciplined. And so do as he does and listen to him. I'll tell you our house is crazy. It really is all the time. We have, our, I guess our oldest just went to college, so we have, we have two to 19 in just about every two years. So the, the number of times we're all sitting down is very rare. The number of times we're all quietly sitting down, it, it doesn't exist. <laughs> so we, we do what we can. Uh, I always pray at night when I put the kids to bed. Uh, we pray before meals. When we are sitting there, we, in, we, in, we don't, aren't rushing out the door somewhere. We do something very simple for family worship. Just doing something is better than doing nothing. Uh, to plan a great thing and great intentions, but to do a hymn, a Bible passage, share, you know, highs and lows is what my kids love to do. It's, it, and, and then just modeling so that your kids see you at different times in dad's chair or wherever, in mom's spot with a Bible open in prayer pays huge dividends. So uh, there, there are so much better models than, than I am, I, I admit, for the very disciplined, conscientious family worship night after night. We do what we can uh, very haphazardly, I admit, but a spirit and season of prayerfulness is important. And here's more than anything, um, I won't get too personal. My, my dad is very sick. He's, I don't know how, if he's going to make it, um, how long. He's 73. But I'll say this, um, the great gift that he's given, and I hope I give to my family as well. Uh, yes, he led us in prayer and did all sorts of other things. I never doubted. He loved my mom. He loved his kids, he loved the church, he loved Jesus. You can, the rest, figure out the plan, the schedule, the habits, the books, do all of that stuff. And you do all that stuff and you don't do those things, your kids are, they're gone. Uh, so it's, it's a lifetime of faithfulness, not discounting those times of prayer at bed, but to give to your family 
that, comp- that, that, is, that, is t- that is caught, not taught. They never doubt it. Just what seems normal. Mom and dad love each other. Mom and dad take us to church. All of those things. Most of you are already doing it. And if you're doing that, you are living a life of otherworldliness that pleases God. So keep doing it. That's really good. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that I was in the Navy and my student company commander was a Marine Corps recon ranger. And, and so when, when I got married, I was, you know, we have a small family. We only have five kids. Um, <clears throat> I was like, I was Captain Von Trapp from the, you know, without the whistle. And so I just wanted my kids to be ordered. I wanted everything to be scheduled. And, and Janine, my wife, said, um, Juan, do you, do you want a home that looks like Better Homes and Gardens, or do you want a relationship with your kids? And I said, can we have both? <laughs> and, um, but she, she really helped me understand what Kevin is saying. Just the need to, to have that relationship with our kids. And um, I, I do think there's, there's an importance in planning, but there's just an, you know, there, there's a myth of quality time. Quality time actually emerges from just time. Uh, just being together, just doing things together, and just just that time that we have with our children, that Deuteronomy 6 kind of living, you know, waking up in the morning together, you know, going to bed. But we, we did try to have a little bit of, of structure. And interestingly enough, what we realized, even with five kids, we had two sets of kids. We had the olders and the littles. And um, we realized we were less intentional with the littles, and we just had to kind of re-engage. So just because of our schedule, we could sit and have breakfast together, and we just enjoyed our time together, and we just read a chapter of scripture, asked questions, and then just asked how we can be praying for each one, uh, each other for, for the day. At nighttime, we would just read aloud. That became one, an important piece in our family, the Chronicles of Narnia, you know, the Hobbit, just those kinds of things, just reading aloud. When they were little, I would I would put them to bed. So I would do the reading and catechism, and then I would pray with each one of them, something I learned from, from a friend of mine. And it was during that time that I had one-on-one time with each of them. Um, and uh, that, that just became a really, really sweet time for us. So, so you know, there's something helpful to me about a schedule and order, but just living life together. We would love riding in the car together. We did some camping early on. Um, but just being together, that, that those family connections that emerge just from time together. That's great. Two-minute round, brother, so 30 seconds each. Oh, did you want to add something on this? I, I would. Um, there are just three categories that I've, we have tried. Of course, scheduled prayer, but our schedule at times gets chaotic and it all gets thrown out the window. The other two, though, they are strategic times of prayer yes, as a family. That's good. And... That has been a blessing, and I have had to be the one in the, in the development of my family years to take the lead of that. So I would have to be vulnerable if I was struggling with something, if something difficult was happening in the ministry, to tell the family of, about an issue and tell them during these days I need or a project I needed to finish. But it it was teaching us to pray not just scheduled times but strategically. What has been most helpful to us is just spontaneous prayer. Good. Our family eats and talks. That's what we do as a family. <laughs> and I have, I have had to be sensitive to make sure that spontaneously we are inserting in those times as the conversations are happening, meaningful moments of prayer where conversations about what's going on turns into moments of prayer. And th- that just requires an openness and a sensitivity to take advantage of those, That's those good. times. That's good. Yeah, this is, let, me just, let me just add, one of the things that is helpful is to, when there are great needs in the family, to invite your children to pray for those things. And when the Lord answers those yes. prayers, celebrate yes. those with your children yeah, right. so that they see the Lord is answering our prayers. Yeah.
It's good. Brothers, it's been <coughs> such rich conversation. Let's just have 30 seconds each on any recommended resource, and then Jonathan Carswell's going to tell us about some books, and then uh, we want folks to have a good break. Uh, I'll mention just two, and then 30 seconds uh, each. Uh, Don Carson's uh, used to be called um, A Call to Spiritual Reformation. Is it now called Praying with Paul? I think it's been uh, Paul's Prayers. Yeah. Absolutely marvelous, goes through Paul's prayers in the New Testament. The other thing that I found really helpful is Spurgeon has a sermon called Order and Argument in Prayer. If you just Google that title, you'll get it. Uh, Order and Argument in Prayer. He goes through several prayers in Scripture and shows how a case is presented to God in prayer. I find that very helpful. Uh, Kevin, let's come back this way. A hymnal. Valley of Vision. I mentioned just some lesser known books probably, but Ben Patterson has good books on prayer. This book by David Hansen, Long Wandering Prayer, was influential for me when I read it years ago. And then, I don't know if anyone's mentioned in the conference, uh, Johnny Gibson put together this book, Be Thou My Vision, which is excellent, and I commend all of you. It's, it's sort of taking the best of kind of a it's sort of Anglican Book of Common Prayer tradition and then putting it in so it has 31 days, so you can do it through a month, and it gives a, a reading, a confessional reading, goes, you can use McShane's. Re it's, it's a wonderful way if you say, what do I do? What is someone in my church? How do I just have a quiet time? There it is. It's really rich. So it's called Be Thou My Vision. HP? Yep, I would mention the Carson book on prayer. There's a book I read years ago that I reread recently, Dick Eastman's little book, The Hour That Changes the World, um, was a blessing to me, and I was refreshed in reading it again. And on top of that, I would just affirm the Valley of Vision and, yeah, and, a, and a good hymnal. Yeah, uh, HB has a book on prayer. Um, also, um, you know, the books that have already been mentioned. Uh, I found A Praying Life by Paul Miller just a very helpful book for people that just don't even know where to begin. He just, you know, just demythologizes what we think prayer is in very helpful ways. Um, uh, I, I'm losing it now, but uh, I, I can't remember. Oh, uh, Don Whitney has some books that are helpful, uh, Praying the Bible. So I do think scripture and prayer go hand in hand, yeah. but Praying the Bible, he helps you know how to, how to use scripture and, and pray the Psalms. And so, you know, the, the Bible should be our number one prayer book. Uh, HB's mentioned hymnals. And, um, uh, and then other books like The Valley of Vision, prayers that have been written that are helpful for us, including in Scripture, learning how to pray from prayers in Scripture, whether it's Paul's or Nehemiah's or, you know, in chapter 2, Nehemiah has what we call the arrow prayer. It's like, oh, I'm, I'm before the king. Let me just shoot this arrow real fast. You know, so they're just learning from, from people who have prayed all, you know, in all different contexts. <laughs>